my job is to kind of set the stage on the, uh, for the rest of the presenters this morning. And um, I'd like to introduce some of the rangeland health science tools that have been kind of been grafted uh, from the grazing world into this world of reclamation and restoration that we're talking about this morning. Next slide. Uh, Alberta has five and a half million hectares of native grassland in the grassland natural region, the central parkland. That total is missing some of the grasslands in the peace parkland as well as the uh, montane grasslands of the southwest. So that number's, number's a little low. Um, about uh, two thirds of this land base is uh, under uh, public, public ownership, public management. And uh, recent efforts like the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan has highlighted the need to conserve our remaining native prairie. Uh, grassland ecosystems are considered the most altered of our natural landscapes. Uh, an important development in the past decade that has uh, found its way into the reclamation world is the development of the rangeland health assessment protocol. And this was developed for grasslands, for grazed forests, and for tame pastures as well. This protocol applies five indicators to gain a measure of the health and function of rangeland plant communities. And along with the indicators, we also need an ecological reference or a standard uh, in the form of a plant community classification system. Here's uh, four, four images from the famous Staveley, the iconic four field stocking rate study. And sadly, Agriculture Canada will be closing Staveley and one four and we're hoping to find another pathway for these sites so that research can continue there. But this study was started in 1949. It's a wonderful place to visit, and we do a lot of, the forum does, uh, hosts an annual training event at Staveley, and it's an excellent place to, to gain a real practical understanding of uh, rangeland plant ecology. So in the upper left, we have a rough fescue, Perry's oatgrass community type, uh, in the Foothills Fescue grassland on a loamy range site, and on a beezer soil. We also have uh, three successional plant communities, the product of heavier rates of disturbance and grazing, moderate, heavy, and very heavy stocking. And um, we're, this is what we refer to as secondary plant succession. We'll, we'll talk about primary later when we start to focus more squarely on reclamation. Our range health indicators are reasonably easy to apply with some basic training. And even sitting in your chairs, looking at these images, you can see differences in species, structure, litter or mulch cover, soil exposure beyond ex what's expected, and the presence or absence of weeds. A few words about classification. This is a very busy slide and I don't expect you to, to be able to read all of it. I just want you to, to notice that over on the far left, we, the, our classification system is nested within the natural regions of Alberta. Uh, classification or uh, a document, uh, 2005, and uh, uh, adapted further from the original Strong and Leggett classification that some of the uh, more senior folks in the audience have worked with. Over on the far right of the image is where we want to be on the ground, plant community type. So what I wanted to just highlight is that depending on what you're working with in the province, if you're working mostly with forest classification versus prairie grassland classification, how you use tools to get to plant community uh, made, will differ slightly. So here's a, a graphic that shows for the grassland natural region, uh, we go from within our natural subregions, uh, in order to get to ecological site, which will, we will characterize with a plant community type, we first have to go through range site. And, and that's, a, that's a real help to us because we have a lot of soils information that we don't have in the forested landscape of the province. Over on the right hand side, the, the edi, what's called the ediotopic grid, I'll show you that in a minute, the moisture nutrient gradient uh, re regime uh, utilizes things like species indicators and other site features to go directly to ecological site. So we name these things differently. If, you, if, it's, if somebody talks about ecocyte, ecocyte phase, you're talking about the moisture nutrient framework if you hear the term ecological range site, we're talking about getting to plant community using soils and site information such as we have in, in the prairie and such as what Ron is going to talk about, the grassland vegetation inventory. Um, classification tools have been developed by uh, the department that I'm with 
it's, I think we're on, I'm on my fifth departmental name now in my career, Environment and Sustainable Resource Development. When I say lands and forests, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, because of the, we've had a standardized classification or a standardized uh, uh, inventory, vegetation inventory protocol for many decades, we have collected a great deal of information. And uh, the standard methodology is captured in the range survey manual. You see the cover of it there and that's available on our website. Now some of the sources of reference data that we classify and process into these classification tools that we're talking about today. Um, one of the, one, an important source is our rangeland reference area program. And I think we're the only province that has anything quite like this. We have 182 sites across the province, uh, 120 of them in the grasslands. And uh, at these uh, upper right picture shows an ungrazed reference area. Uh, lower right is a grazed area, that usually grazed at light to moderate rates. And we have agronomy cages there to measure annual forage production. We'll monitor species composition every third year and productivity on an annual basis. So this, this is really important long-term data that, that, that uh, is important for classification. Another, uh, we have, we also, the vast majority of the plots that we use for classification will come from um, other partners, from industry, from NGOs, from across the landscape. And I think um, the data that we've collected combined with the historic data that's, that was invested there from forest classification as well, I think we're probably having in excess of 27,000 plots now. So what we've done is we've taken ownership now for this data set. It's a, a bit, little bit of the story of the little red hen. Everybody wants to eat the bread, but no one wants to help bake it. So we've taken responsibility for this data set and we've, we've rejigged uh, the old ESIS database, which some of you may recognize, tied that together with our ecological site description database into a new fancy database called ECOSYS. So we have uh, on the left, we have data coming from research and monitoring on the landscape and reference areas into the database. And we classify and produce these value added products. And, and of course, uh, all, of those, all of those products uh, flow together to serve our, our many clients. Just a few words about classification. We, um, we utilize ecological information to help understand, describe, and quantify the land base to help in management decisions. It facilitates the, the collection and organization of environmental information, creates a language for understanding landscapes that can be communicated between user groups, it helps us to recognize and quantify the potential of a site, and create a basis for measurement. So here's an example of uh, uh, using multivariate analysis to cluster plot data into uh, to a number of potential plant community types. We may also, uh, in addition to the, uh, the um, multivariate techniques, we, we may also use cluster analysis. And together, when we combine that with environmental data and information about disturbance history, we're able to make sense of these clusters and, and describe them as plant communities, either reference plant communities or successional plant communities. Um, this, uh, these ordination tools have been very useful in the reclamation world as well. And this is just a, an old example of a, a project that I did a few years ago in a pipeline study, looking at uh, natural recovery, a control, and two different uh, seed mixtures, the old crested wheat. You can tell that this is a fairly old uh, graphic. We were still testing crested wheat as an option, and then a wheatgrass mixture. So, so just, as we, just as we can track and ordinate plant community information to look at similar, similarities and dis, dissimilarities in terms of the basic plant succession, this also helps us to understand and track what's happening in the reclamation process. And, and my colleagues will say a lot more about that as we go through the morning. So there's the edetopic grid. And again, on the forested landscape, we'll go directly to the, to the ecological site. Uh, using the moisture nutrient grid and other things like species, indicator species. So this list here is, the, is kind of where we started in the late 90s. And with, uh, with the assistance of Ron McNeil, we, uh, we developed, um, we, we moved from this very subjective framework with the site types that we inherited from the old US Soil Conservation Service. 
we went from a kind of a very subjective way of applying these to a much more structured approach, more objective and structured approach. And so one of the things that Ron did was to take uh, these uh, uh, basic site types, which still have a lot of utility for the user on the ground, and then he correlated them with soil series and, uh, and uh, other soil landscape features, textural groupings, and this sort of thing, and created a more, a more rigorous and structured approach to arriving at range site. So uh, AgriSid was very, very important to us in the early days, uh, and as well as detailed soil surveys, and those tools are still useful today. Uh, we should know how to use them, and this is detective work very often when we're trying to understand a plant community. So uh, uh, very, very important uh, to, to this day. Um, now here's, here's essentially what, um, with improved soil, soil correlation data, it basically allows us to subdivide our range sites into uh, ecological range sites. So in this example, we have, uh, we have defined six plant communities, each, and these, each of these six plant communities have distinctive uh, site uh, characteristics. And so this example is for loamy. The top of the scale would be the most moist of the plant community types, the driest at the bottom. And so within that whole range of soils in the Foothills Fescue Natural Subregion, uh, we, we now have, have that divided into six distinct ecological sites. The uh, range plant community description, um, the, the uh, narrative at the top kind of captures what we know from the published science. Uh, also some tacit knowledge is captured there as well. We'll have a measure of the robustness of the um, plant community based on the sample size. This one is based on 19 samples, so that's probably a, a, pretty, a pretty robust community. Lower, in the lower left quadrant, we have uh, species cover information describing the range of uh, species and the range of cover types and constancy, and then environmental variables over on the right that help us to understand where we find this in the landscape. Uh, when, we, when we review plant community tables, each ecological range site will have one reference plant community. If we have enough data, we will also describe successional plant communities that may result, just like the picture I showed you at the beginning, that may result from grazing disturbance. We also have a class of plant community we call modified, and those are plant communities that where, where the native species have been largely replaced by uh, invasive species like Kentucky bluegrass, smooth brome, and timothy, that sort of thing. Here's where we're trying to, here's where we're trying to get to, is this, the state and transition diagram. The green boxes show us, like that earlier picture from Staveley, the secondary succession. This is what we know about how grazing will affect the plant community. The new world that we're working in with the new reclamation criteria and with the studies that we'll share this morning, we're uh, developing new knowledge over with the orange dashed boxes. Primary succession, how does plant community succession proceed from bare soil? And what can we do in terms of our best practice to hasten that process to get us back to those green boxes? That's essentially what, what we're trying to do with the new reclamation criteria. Next. So here's uh, just our, our plant community guides are uh, for uh, most of the natural subregions of the province. We have these guides prepared and they're available on the SRD website and we have some for sale here today at our booth outside. An important, an important component of uh, our application uh, has, is really being enhanced by this, by this new tool that we call GVI. Uh, GVI allows us now to routinely stratify the landscape. In this example, I'm mapping the dominant uh, uh, GVI site types, which translate to range site types, and this allows me to access my classification. So by going directly to range site, I can go, once I'm out on the ground, I can go into my plant community guide. It narrows the search down for me. I can't predict plant community from a, re a remotely sensed product at this time. We still have to get out there on the ground and use other cues, other information to actually determine what the range site type is. But this hastens that process and makes it more systematic. Once we have made this determination, 
then we are ready to go forward with a health assessment. We can use this tool in pre-site assessment, in designing a reclamation seed mix, or in evaluating a reclamation outcome.